That's pretty cool. One more time, I like to repeat the things that are cool. Another stance that undermines efforts towards imagining and enacting non-capitalist futures is what Walter Benjamin called left melancholia, in which attachment to a past political analysis or identity is stronger than the interest in present possibilities for mobilization, alliance, or transformation. Certainly, the left has experienced monumental losses, and perhaps, perhaps ultimately a loss of confidence. In the viability of state socialism, the re resiliency of social democracy, the credibility of Marxism, the buoyancy and the efficacy of solidarity movements, rather than grieving and letting go, the melancholic subject identifies with lost ideals, experiencing their absence as feelings of desolation and dejection, whereas mourning, f whereas mourning frees the subject to move on. Melancholia is struck and is stuck and isolated, looking backward rather than to the future, looking inward rather than seeking new alliances and connections. Nostalgia for old forms of political organization, like international movements of worker solidarity or unions that had teeth, and, and attachment to political victories of yesteryear, such as the nationalization of industry or protection for key sectors, blinds us to the political opportunities at hand. We come, quote, we come to love our left possession pat. Beep up. <laughs> quote, we come to love our left passions and reasons, our left analyses and convictions, more than we love the existing world that we presumably seek to alter. Uh, from W. Brown, 1999, paraphrasing Thangamine. Melancholia conserves and preserves, turning its ha hatred toward the new and blaming those who betray the old ideals. And I'm going to repeat that one time because I left out something. Melancholia conserves and preserves, turning its hatred toward the new and blaming those, including post-structuralists and practitioners of identity politics, who betray the old ideals. It is from this stance that place-based activism of the kind we advocate is seen as accommodationist and div divisive. As a departure from the politics of the past, place-based movements are suspect and likely to be seen as already incorporated into the capitalist world order. Here we have not only the melancholic attachment to the traditional paranoid style of theorizing, but the melancholic impulse to separate from and punish those who stray and innovate. Again, there is work to be done to melt the, quote, frozen heart of the putative leftist. Putative. What does that mean? Putative. Putative. Generally considered or reputed to be. Okay. The frozen heart of the putative leftist. Again, there is work to be done to melt the frozen heart of the putative leftist. Where the, cons where the quote, conservative backward looking attachment to feelings, analyses, and relationships blocks any move toward present possibility and connection. W. Brown, 1999. Okay. To be a leftist is historically to be identified with the radical and potential of the exploited and oppressed working class. Excluded from power, yet fixated on the powerful, the radical subject is caught in the familiar resentment of the slave against the master. Feelings of hatred and revenge toward the powerful sit side by side with the moral superiority of the lowly and therefore good, over the high and muddy and therefore bad. Newman, paraphrasing Nietzsche. Moralism provides an emotional shoring up of the reactive stance of the weak, quote, who define themselves in opposition to the strong. With the, with the dissolution in recent times of positive projects of socialist construction, left moralism has been, rec has been energized by increasing investments in injury, failure, and victimhood. When power is identified with what is ruthless and dominating, it becomes something that something the left must distance itself from, lest it be co-opt or compromised. Newman, 2000. Fearing implication with those in power, we become attached to guarding and de demonstrating our purity, rather than mucking around in everyday politics. Those who engage in such work may find themselves accused of betraying their values, sleeping with the enemy, bargaining with the devil. All manner of transgression and betrayal. A moralistic stance fuels doubts about whether local economic experimentation can do anything but shore up a repressive state apparatus, or whether action research produce, reproduces the power of the manipulative academic over the passive community. Focused on the glass half-empty rather than half-full, 
This angry and skeptical political sensibility is seldom, if ever, satisfied. Successful political innovation seems perpetually blocked or postponed because it requires an entirely new relation to power. It will need to escape power, go beyond it, obliterate it, transform it, making the radical shift from a controlling, dominating power to an enabling, liberating one. But since distance from power is the marker of authentic radicalism and desire is bound up in the purity of powerlessness, the move to re-inhabit power is deferred. If we are to make the shift from victimhood to potency, from judgment to enactment, from protest to positive projects, we also need to work on the moralistic stance that clings to a singular conception of power and blocks experimentation with power in its many forms. Widely present, if not fully manifest in any person or pronouncement, this culture of thinking and feeling creates a political sensibility that is paradoxically depol depoliticized. The theoretical closure of paranoia, the backward-looking political certainty of melancholia, and the moralistic skepticism toward power render the world effectively uncontestable. The accompanying effects... At <clears throat> The accompanying affects of despair, separation, and resentment are negative and repudiating, inhospitable, inhospitable to adventure and innovation, at best cautious and lacking in tem temer temerity. From our perspective, these stances are what must be worked against if we are to pursue a new economic politics. Thankfully, those same theorists who have helped to identify the barely con conscious contours of a habit of thinking that blocks possibility have also led us to potential strategies for loosening its hold over us. The practices of what Nietzsche called the self-artistry of self-overcoming and Foucault called self-cultivation or care of the self are an important entry point for effecting changes in thinking and being in the world. If our goal as thinkers is the proliferation of different economies, what we need most is an open and inhospitable orientation toward the objects of our thought. We need to foster a, quote, love of the world, as Aaron sa says, rather than masterful knowing, or melancholy or moralistic detachment. To do this, perhaps, we need to draw on the pleasures of friendliness, trust, and conviviality, and companion companionable connection. Our, re our repertory of tactics might include seducing, cajoling, enrolling, enticing, inviting. There could be a greater role in our thinking for invention and playfulness, enchantment and exuberance. We could start, we could start to develop an interest in, in unpredictability, contingency, experimentation, or even an attachment to the limits of understanding and the possibilities of escape. Okay, next section entitled Shifting Stances. How do we disinvest in what we are, what we habitually feel and do, and turn ourselves to a project of becoming? How do we work against mastery, melancholia, and moralism to, and cultivate capacities that can energize and support the creation of other economies? If we want other worlds and other economies, how do we make ourselves a condition of possibility for their emergence? Clearly, there are powerful pressures that keep us thinking and feeling in the same old ways, but as Connolly points out, there are also, quote, countervailing pressures and possibilities at work in the layered corporate reality of cultural beings. Thinking bounces in magical bumps and charges across zones marked by differences of speed, capacity, and intensity. It is above all in the dicey relations between the zones that the seeds of creativity are planted. For thinking, again, is not harnessed by the tasks of representation and knowledge, Though its layered intra- and intercorporeality new ideas, theories, and identities are something propelled into being, these new ideas, concepts, sensibilities, and identities later become objects of knowledge. Thinking is thus creative as well as rep representative, and its creativity is aided by the fact that the process of thinking is not entirely controlled by the agents of thought. End quote. There are, he suggests, experimental practices that we can employ to re-educate ourselves to convince our bodies to adopt fundamentally different attitudes that we, quote, that we intellectually entertain as a belief, quote, thereby producing new effective uh, relationships with the world. 
we can work in the conscious realm to devise practices that produce the kind of embodied, affect-imbued pre-thoughts that we want to foster. And in the daily rehearsal of these practices, we can hope that they will become part of our makeup, part of our cell memory, that will increasingly assert itself without resort to conscious calling. Next section. Practicing weak theory, adopting reparative motives, and producing positive affect. What if we believed, as Sedgwick suggests, that the goal of theory were not only to extend and deepen knowledge by confirming what we already know, that the world is full of cruelty, misery, misery and loss, a place of domination and systemic, systemic oppression, what if we asked theory to do something else? To help us see openings, to help us to find happiness, to provide a space of freedom and, pro and possibility. As a means of getting theory to yield something new, Sedgwick, su su mm. Sedgwick suggests reducing its reach, localizing its purview, practicing a, quote, weak form of theory that cannot encompass the present and shut down the future. Little more than description, weak theory couldn't know that social experiments are already co-opted and thus doomed to fail or to reinforce dominance. It couldn't tell us that the world economy will be transformed by an international revolutionary movement rather than through the disorganized proliferation of local projects. Zen master Shunryu Suzuki reminds us that in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are few. The practice of doing weak theory requ requires acting as a beginner, refusing to know too much, allowing success to inspire and failure to educate, refusing to extend diagnoses too widely or deeply. Weak theory can be undertaken with a reparative motive that welcomes surprise, entertains hope, makes connection, tolerates coexistence, and offers care for the new. As the impulse to judge or discredit other theoretical agendas arises, one can practice making room for others, imagining a terrain on which the success of one project need not come at the expense of another. Producing such spaciousness is particularly useful for a project of rethinking the economy where the problem is the scarcity rather than the incons inconsistency of economic concepts. Reparative theorizing can be called upon Take that one again. Reparative theorizing can be called on to open our assessments of repudiated movements and practices, fostering affinities and even affiliations. We can choose to cultivate appreciation, taking heart, for example, from the, from the ways that identity politics has opened doors to class politics, or in the ways in which a, politic, in which a politics of recognition is also a politics of redistribution. We can practice relinquishing melancholic attachment to the past with its established narratives and, and entrenched blame. With a commitment to coexistence, we can work toward a way of thinking that might place us alongside our political others, mutually recognizable as oriented in the same direction, even if pursuing different paths. Practicing weak theory allows us to de-exoticize power, accepting it as our mundane, pervasive, uneven milieu. We can observe how we produce our own powerlessness with respect to the economy, for example, by theorizing unfolding logics and structural formations that close off the contestable arrangements we associate with politics. As we teach ourselves to come back with a beginner's mind to possibilities, we can begin to explore the multiple forms of power, their spatialities and temporalities, their modes and transmission, reach and in effect reach and, parentheses, in, effectivity, effectivity. A differentiated landscape of force, constraint, freedom, and opportunity emerges, and we can open to the surge of positive energy that suddenly becomes available for mobilization. In the last part of this chapter, we present a reading of two films, showing how one, the full Monty, portrays movements that sidestep the paranoia, melancholia, and moralism of traditional left thinking as exemplified in the other, brassed off. Our aim is to illustrate the stance that we feel needs to be cultivated for the task of imagining and enacting post-capitalist politics. What follows, then, is an, is an experiment in reading what might nudge us toward a different affective relationship to the world and its possibilities.